Good evening, Controls Freaks. Let's talk about the productivity series from Automation Direct tonight, shall we? Get it opened up here. I'm basically going to walk you through setting up a new system, um, start a new project. We've got the P1550 as our processor. And we're going to go to hardware configuration. Double click here. Sorry, there. And then if we click off of that, if we click in here, we can go in here and we can see all of our, our processor parameters. Change pretty much everything we want to. Heartbeat bit. You can see the list. There's an endless number of, of things you can do there. You can change all your IP address stuff. Uh, you can enable the web server and the mobile function. Uh, mess with your serial ports, my, all your baud rates, all that kind of thing, and so on. But right now we're just going to leave all that as it is. And we're going to go ahead and add an input card. It's actually a combo card. In this case it's going to be a P115CDD2 right here. So when it pops up what we're going to do we're going to go ahead and I, I like the way they do this. You can name your I.O. right here during the setup phase. So we're going to call this one green PB for push button. We're going to call this one, let's see, what is input number two? It's a red push button. So we're going to call this one red PB. And then on our outputs, we're going to call this one, let me remember what output number one is on that PLC. It is also green PB, which is a lighted push button. And I'm just hitting tab to go from one to the other, just like you would in any other program. And then output number two is another green push button and we'll call that green PB2 so now we've got a couple things named um, oh. we'll call this uh, green PB lamp you saw there it, it won't let me use the same name more than once which makes sense and we're gonna hit OK so now we've got some IO named declared however you want to put it, and we're set up and, and ready to start doing something. Now I've gone in and made some changes to the way that this displays, put the shading on the alternate rungs, double thickness of the rungs, that sort of thing. Um, it, it just, it's a matter of preference. You can set it up however you want, but so that basically gets your hardware set up. If you want to go back to that hardware config upper left corner, if you want to add more, if you, like I've got an analog module in here, an analog combo module, I'm not going to use it right now, but if I wanted to, I could double click it, set it up, bring it in here, give the tag names, and it, it makes it really easy being able to do that on setup. I'm not saying other manufacturers don't do that, but it, it just it seems pretty simple here. <laughs> So now we're going to look at some of our, our instructions over here. And we're going to start out with a normally open contact block, which in order to do that, all we got to do is type NO, enter, enter. And we're going to call this one green. Now you see it autofills, green PB. And we've got our green push button set up there. And we're going to come over here and let's trigger a timer with that, which would be a simple timer, so STMR, and we'll get into their timers. Now in these you're going to want to use the structure most of the time, and we're going to call this, um, call it 
lamp delay lamp on delay and we're going to put it at a one second base and we're going to hit OK and now it's going to pop up here. Now what I like about this if you want to set a preset time for that and you're not going to be changing your preset time you just double click here and we're going to make it five seconds. So it's going to delay turning that output on or, or the, the, the done bit of the timer on for five seconds at this point. And your current value, of course, that's going to change as the timer runs and your done bit is a bool. It's a, it's a discrete. It's an on or an off. So we're going to hit OK. And you'll notice one thing that they don't have that Alan Bradley does is the dot .tt or the timer timing. Well, the way I get around that, I come down here and in order to draw a line, you just hit control and an arrow key. That's what I did right there was control and down. And then I'm going to go over, which actually I want to come back. And right here, I'm going to put a normally closed. And I'm going to call it lamp on delay done. Okay. And then over here, we're going to put an out bit. O U T, and we're going to call it lamp on delay. And I always use underscore because they won't let you use a dot in your own tag names, but underscore TT. Okay, and that's going to give you a bool. And you can put comments in here at this point. Um, you can turn these whenever you're doing integers and that kind of thing you can you can really make a lot of changes while you're defining the tag but so right now as you can see if that green push buttons on and the timers counting it's going to turn this bit on as long as that timer is not done once the timer gets done this is going to drop out and your dot tt or your timer timing is going to go away so that's a way to, to give quickly give yourself the TT, the timer timing, even though it doesn't give it to you automatically. So next we're going to come down here, and this one is actually a uh, uh, normally closed contact block on the back of the red push button, but we're going to call it red PB. And we're going to come over here, and I'm going to show you what just a regular timer looks like. Now, I don't use these very often, but they could be very powerful if you really wanted them to. Um, as you can see, they've got a reset to value that you can put in. They've got a preset value, just like any other timer. They've got a current, just like another timer. But they've also got this equal, this less than, and this greater than. Now, there was a point where I played around with the idea of using the equal and the greater than to kind of do my timer timing. I found this up here to be easier, but on these you can time up, you can time down, or you can reset the timer. They're pretty complex. We're not going to use one right now. I just wanted to show you the instruction. So um, what we will do here, I think, is we will go ahead and... Hmm, Let's do a flasher coil. So that's FLS. And the nice thing about this, if you've got a light you want to flash, and I talked about this in my previous video, if you've got a light you want to flash at a certain rate or whatever, um, you, you easily can simply by using their flasher. So if I go green PB lamp right here, well, whenever I push that red push button, this green lamp is going to flash on a second, off a second. And of course, you can change that if you want half a second, if you want quarter second, 250 milli, uh, milliseconds. It's it's pretty straightforward the way the their flasher works, but it, it prevents you from having to write a timer, or two timers, really, one for the on time, one for the off time just to get a flasher. It it works pretty good. 
So we'll get rid of that. I just wanted to show you that as well. And we will go to uh, set and reset, which is uh, like a latch and unlatch. And you can make all of these, pretty much all of these coils, these outputs, you can make them one shots. But a set coil and a reset coil, I stay away from them. I try to latch stuff the old fashioned way. But there is a place for a set and reset. Just it's best practice. If you're going to use a set and a reset, only use it in one place, set it in one place, reset it in one place, and be done with it there. Because if not, if you're using it in multiple locations throughout the program, it can get really kind of crazy. Things can start happening weird, and, and it's it's not a whole lot of fun to, to try to track down when you're going back and trying to uh, troubleshoot it later. Anyway, that's the set. That's the reset. If I could double click. Um, oh, there we go. My computer was just being slow. Nothing special to them. And on all of these, if you open their help file. Wow, my computer's being really slow right now. Interesting. Well, we'll wait. There it is. Kind of. Their help instructions or help files, whenever you open them up, are very informative. They give you a whole lot of information. They tell you what every single parameter is, exactly how the set and reset timing works. Um, it's kind of ironic. They've used latch one and latch two over here, <laughs> unlatch one and unlatch two, in, in in place of set and reset. But I digress. All of their help files are very very helpful. I think the reason my computer's being so slow is I've got my screen recorder going and I've got an audio recorder going separately because my screen recorder, the one I'm currently using, will only record in mono. And I don't want to have to go back and mess with that after the fact. So I'm recording audio and recording the screen all at the same time. Anyway, they've also got a timed coil. So you can have that be on for a specific amount of time. And you can have the output maintained beyond that time if your, your input over to the left is still on. So there's two different ways to do it. If you don't have the output maintained, whenever you trigger it, it's going to come on and it's going to stay on for that specific amount of time and it's going to drop off. No matter what. Whether your in input's high or low, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's it's going to stay on for that amount of time. If you have the output maintained on and your trigger, your, your input, whatever is turning that bit on, is still high beyond the timer, then it's going to stay high even longer. Um, very useful if you've got something that you want to to turn on and leave on for a specific amount of time. Anytime it's triggered, can come in really, really handy. Okay, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of the real deep stuff today, but we did timers and we'll do a counter. So we'll do CNT and we'll use structure. Actually, I wanted to use simple counter, my bad. SCNT. And it's a lot like the timer, only instead of timing, it counts. But you've got your preset. You've got your current and you've got your done. So if we set up a counter, and we'll go ahead and do this. Uh, the only difference with this is you do have a reset, the difference from a timer. But we'll go ahead and call this um, red PB counter. Now, you see it automatically defaults everything to a 32-bit integer. You can change that if for some reason you want to just by clicking it. Um, you, you can, like I said, comments, rows and columns for arrays. There, there's so much you can do. You can make them retentive or not. And 
once we go into the tag database here in a minute, you'll see where you can make these forcible. Every bit, unlike Alan Bradley, everything's not forcible in here. Um, you have to go into the tag database and specifically make that forcible, which I think it's kind of nice because I, I don't like every bit being forcible, depending on who's playing around on the program. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn that on, and we're going to come down here. And we're going to put a normally open here for our reset. And we're going to make it, let me see what button I can use here. We'll use input three. So we'll click over here and we'll go ahead and drop down to direct input number three which we didn't name earlier because I wasn't planning on using it, but we have to have a reset for this. So there we have it right there. It is now hooked up, ready to go. That counter, every time I push that button, will count up one until I hit reset. Um, I didn't put a preset on there, so that gives us a good excuse to get into the tag database. And the way I typically do this is I'll invert this. I'll come over here and I'll search for what I'm look, looking for and we called that red PB counter red PB counter we'll drop it down and on our preset our initial value will make it five so once we get done with that five times we push it five times it'll be done the counter done bit will go high but while we're in here I want you to look at what all's available here You've got I.O. address, columns, wire label. For your I.O., you can actually put your wire label. Let's actually look at some, uh, some I.O. over here. Let's look at just discrete inputs and outputs. Let's turn everything else off. They make it pretty easy to narrow it down what you want to look at in the database. So if we're just looking at our I.O. and we want to give that a wire label, we can actually put what our wire label is in the program. Pretty nice. We can make it forcible, as I said previously. You can do that on pretty much any bit. We can make it initially forced or give it an initial force value if it's a, a, a integer or something other than a bool. And we can make it uh, visible to remote data viewers I'm not sure what the default display format is about, but it also shows you if it's in use. And it acts kind of like Excel. If you click any column, it brings them all to the top. So it's kind of nice if you're done writing a program and you've created bits while you're writing that you're not using anymore. It's easy to go in, look at what's in use, get rid of what's not. Um, I typically don't get rid of system bits and that sort of thing, but still, it, it's pretty easy to go in get rid of bits you're, that you've created and you're no longer using just to kind of clean up the database a little bit. Um, speaking of system bits, while we're on that, we will go to system data and we'll get rid of this over here so that'll disappear. You can kind of look down through here. There's a lot available to use. I mean, you got your typical first scan bit. There's an always off bit. Every other scan bit, battery low, battery disabled, forces enabled. We'll let you know if there's any forces enabled at all. You got a one minute, a two second, uh, whether your switch is in run or stop, which is great if you want to throw a notification up on an HMI in case for some reason your HMI has been switched into stop. It'll let you know you got your error bits, IO error bits. Uh, I.O. configuration error, watchdog timeout. I mean, you can see, you get down into your critical error logs, non-critical error logs, your last scan interval, so you can have it throw your PLC scan interval up either on the HMI, or you could even theoretically program it to where it shows on the front of the PLC and the little, there's a little uh, display on the front of these PLCs that I'll throw a picture up in here that makes it nice. You can throw information up on there if you want. Firmware version. There, there's just so much they make available 
as far as system data is concerned. And you see they've all got good comments written over here telling you exactly what they are and what they do. Um, I mean, it's... I, I'm a big, big fan. I mean, yeah, Alan Bradley is what I originally learned on, as a lot of people in the U.S. have, but these things, I've put dozens and dozens and dozens of these productivity series processors in plants, and they're running to this day, and knock on wood, I have never had to replace a PLC component on a productivity series PLC. In fact, the only thing I've bought, I've had two things that I've bought from Automation Direct that have failed. One of them was a 40 amp, uh, 480 to 24 volt power supply, three phase 480 to 24 VDC power supply that went bad shortly after we bought it. And then I had one of the Rhino label labelers that went bad. It, it wouldn't. It was DOA. It wouldn't power on out of the box. Now I've bought two of those labelers and I like them. They they work fairly well. But for some reason, the second one I bought. I had to send back because it was DOA. It wouldn't power on out of the box. Anyway, so that's the tag database. And like I said, there's a lot you can do in here. A whole lot you can do in here. It, it can really show you anything you need to know. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go ahead and we're going to throw this program into the PLC and I'm going to show you how to monitor your bits to see what's going on. Uh, you know what, let's make something happen after that counter is done. So what we'll do is we'll do a, you know, we'll do red PB counter done. And we'll have it turn on, it'll be an out. And we'll go with... Uh, one output three. Yeah, that'll work. So it's going to be right down here. Output three. Okay, that's a light over here on the trainer, but we're not even going to look at the trainer today. Everything I'm going to show you is pretty much going to take place in here. So let me get online with the PLC and... Um, yeah, I'll get right back with you in just one split second here. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go over here and we're going to choose our CPU. Now you see it's already up there, connected via Ethernet. It's at 10.10.10.1. And we're going to hit connect, and there's already a program in there right now. But we don't want to use that program. We don't want to copy that program because that would delete everything we have up here. We're going to use the PC project. So we're going to go ahead and connect, and we're now online with the PLC. And what we're going to do is we're going to transfer this project. It's going to be a stop mode transfer because we made some substantial changes here. Uh, mainly because I don't have the analog card. If you make Ethernet changes, Modbus changes, um, hardware changes, things along that line, it's going to be a stop mode transfer. You're not going to be able to do the transfer while the CPU is running as normal. It's going to stop the program that's running. Of course, in this case, it was a completely different program. But you, can, you can't make online edits. I mean, you can, um, but not in the sense that you do with Alan Bradley. I mean, I guess really they are. You can make a change and then write it in and do it as a runtime transfer. I'll show you that in just a second, but it, it, it works out just the same. But now we've got this program written in there, okay, and nothing's going on on the trainer, but notice everything on here still looks just the way it did. It's black and white, nothing, no color, you can't see what's what. But we're going to hit monitor. Okay, now you can see that that button's not pushed. That is a normally closed contact on the button so that is actually it's connected it's it's closed right now which is why this is showing as red uh, this button's not pushed and the counter of course is not done 
no done bits made over here you haven't hit your preset nothing along that line so what we're going to do first is we're going to hit that green push button and we're going to hold it for five seconds now notice when I do this TT is going to come on okay that means our timers timing and when we get up to that five seconds notice that dropped out and we let off of course that goes away but once we get up to the five seconds our TT drops out. Timer keeps going, but we've already, our done bit has gone high, which means that the timer's, yes, it's timing, but it's not timing prior to being done. Let me put it that way. Um, that That's just kind of how I do my TT bits if I need them. Okay, next we'll come down here to this red push button. Now you notice I'll push it, and it counted one. I'll push it again, it'll count two three four five that done bit comes on and now I've got a light on over here on the trainer which is this output number three and in order to reset that we decided it was going to be this green button right here and I notice that reset back to zero I mean I understand this is pretty basic stuff now notice if I just bump that that first green push button it's going to reset as soon as I let off. But if I hold it in, let it get up to that five seconds, it'll get done, and then that'll drop out. So here's what we'll do. We'll go ahead and we'll do an online edit right now, a, a runtime edit, and we'll make us a normally open here, and we're going to call it lamp on delay done, right there. And we are going to have it turn on one of our other outputs one that we're not using we're not using number four yet so we're gonna do this and we're gonna do a runtime transfer so the program never quit running and we put that in there now if I hold that down for five seconds when it gets done, my red stack light over here on the trainer just came on because that's what's on output number four. When I let off, it goes off. Everything goes back to zero. And back to the counting. One, two, three, four. If I hit reset, that's going to drop back to zero. One, two, three, four, five. And the done bit went high, and that came on. And then we got to hit reset to turn that back off. I mean, these are... I, I know these are really basic things, but that's really where this all starts. Timers, counters, uh, basic inputs and outputs. Uh, you're, they've got a compare contact, which is pretty cool. Um, it's it's kind of like a equal or not equal. It's kind of all of them combined into one. Alan Bradley's got separate instructions for those types of things, but if I, uh, let's say, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll use lamp on delay current. And when it's equal to red PB counter current, I'll tell you what, we'll say equal then or greater to. We will turn on our next output in line which would be number five I think I've got it wired to something we'll do that as a runtime transfer so right now my amber stack light just came on because these are equal right now they're both at zero so when I push my button up here that amber lights still on for the moment but as soon as this gets over that Uh, it was the other way around so this is still greater it's still equal then or greater so now I've got an amber and a red stack light on but if we hit the red button and get our counter as soon as I hit it the first time that red stack light went off let me hit the reset real quick so right now that red stack light is on as you can see that's right here push it one time well this is now greater than this 
So that red stack light went off. Now if I hit my timer and hold it, as soon as that becomes a 1, they're equal, or it's greater than, and that amber light comes on. As soon as I let off, it goes away. You can see what the output does there. Pretty straightforward, really, the way the compare contact works. But the nice thing about this compare contact compared to the other one, now notice I haven't hit the reset yet, so we're way up there, way past our preset. But you can change what it does. You can make it not equal, you can make it equal, not equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, equal to, or I'm sorry, less than or less than, equal to, all in one comment or instruction. It's instead of having a bunch of different instructions, you do it all in one place. Now, one thing I will show you, and we're going to go ahead and use this for our monitor. We're going to call this, um, we'll just leave it what it is, compare. And we're going to come over here to data view. Oh, let me go ahead and hit that. I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but um, we're not going to make that change. Let's put this back the way it was. Greater than or equal to. You know what, let's just make it equal to. And we'll write that in. And we're going to open our data view. And we've got this data view right here. So this is what we just set up when we hit monitor. It creates what's called a data view. And it lets you see the values of both of those. Let you see what type it is, how you're viewing it. You can view it as a decimal. You can view it as hexadecimal binary. If you want to view it as binary, you can view it as binary, uh, which does come in handy sometimes whenever you're sending integers somewhere and using bits in that integer, using that integer to trigger different bits. It's nice to be able to see, but they have uh, something else for that as well called show bit of word details that you can blow out. And depending on what that, was that the counter? Yeah, that was the counter. So if I hit my button for my counter right now, you're going to see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You're seeing the binary representation of a 32-bit integer of all these numbers. And the more I push it, the more it's going to come on. And you're seeing what each bit in that 32-bit integer is doing, the higher the number gets. We're up to 50 right now. And you can see what's representing that 50 within the integer. It, it comes in pretty handy whenever you're troubleshooting. It really does. But back to what we was doing. Um, where was my reset for that? Right here? Yeah. So let's hit this button on the timer. And you'll see it starts to come up. When I let off, it stops. So you see the amount there of your, your timer. Now, let's say we want to see our output as well. So we are going to, uh, wait a minute, I gotta remember how to, wait a minute. Oh, you just type it in, that's right. Or you go down and select it. Uh, been a minute since I've added this way. I usually just hit monitor. But let's go ahead and put some more of our stuff in here that we're actually using right now. Let me shrink this down so I can see. My memory ain't what it used to be. So we'll go ahead and add our green PB in there. We'll add green PB2 in there. We'll add green PB lamp in there. Oop. We'll add DO3. 
We'll add DO4. We'll add DO5. And is that everything we've got? We don't have our done bits in that for our lamp. But it's a place to start. Just kind of gives you an idea of what you can do with this data view. So now, whenever I push and hold this timer, the timer will start going up. You see the green push button's on. Once we get there, you see that come on. I let off, it goes away. Same with my counter. Right now we're at, we're at zero. One, two, three, four, five. You see that other bit come on. Now if we hold our timer, you get the point. Um, a very useful tool when it comes time to troubleshoot and that sort of thing. Very useful tool. Uh, I, I think we've touched on quite a bit for this evening. Um, we'll, we'll get into some more depth on this and the Seymour HMI and start touching on the Click PLCs. Um, maybe the Do More series. I got a Do More Bricks series in here and we'll show some more on the actual PLC trainer, what's going on there. But if you download the software, it's completely free. There is a simulator built in. So if you want to run this on the simulator, you can literally transfer this into the simulator, hit data view. Uh, I got to remember where the simulator's at. It's been a minute. Toggle IO view. So. Here's all your I.O. right here. Okay, you got to put the the uh, simulator into run mode in order for it to actually work. So now that we've got it in the simulator, this is say you don't have a PLC at home, you don't have a trainer like I do. Um, there, you can still play around with this. Download the software completely free. Write your program. Get into your simulator, add some I.O. So I turn it on. It'll start counting up. When it's done, you're going to see your one output's going to come on down here. You don't have to spend a penny to practice with this stuff. Not a dime. Not a single dime. We click this five times. Our other output comes on. And so on. And if we wanted to come up here to our hardware configuration and we wanted to add an analog combo card and we're just going to leave the default names on there right now but j just to, to show you kind of what I'm talking about if we go back into data view you can now put values into your your analog card and use your analog to to play around in the program as well. So you can act as if you have 4 to 20 milliamp or 0 to 10 volt or plus or minus 10 volt stuff, whatever card you use. You can practice with PID loops. You can practice with pretty much anything within this simulator. I mean, it, it, it's, it may not seem like the most elegant simulator but it's very capable you can you can literally learn how to write programs without spending a penny just by downloading the software digging around YouTube the one thing I wish that that was possible so in the Seymour software for the HMI's uh, there there's a simulator in there as well but You've got to trigger the bits yourself. It'd be nice if the Seymour simulator and the productivity simulator, if any of the engineers from Automation Director are listening, if there was a way to connect within the computer, the same computer, the Seymour simulator and 
the productivity simulator, it would do amazing things for development, troubleshooting, creativity, learning. It would be a, a, a huge benefit to a lot of people. They could literally learn how to do these things without ever spending a dime and then be ready to program that quick. It would be a phenomenal thing to do, I think. But anyway, we've covered quite a bit here. I'm going to get this edited and get it up on YouTube. That way you guys can check it out. Be sure to uh, like, subscribe, comment. Let me know what you want to see. Um, we'll dig deeper into the instruction lists and the productivity series. We'll dig some more into the Seymour, and we'll be tying them together. Now notice, real quick, None of the high-speed I.O. functions are really available over here. That's because we're using a Productivity 1000 right now. The 1000 series, that's the one thing it doesn't have is high-speed I.O. The 2000 series is where the high-speed I.O. starts. And the 3000, of course, has it too. Now, I got a little bit of information from an engineer at Automation Direct that told me to focus on the 2000 because that's where they're putting the bulk of their development. Not sure why, but I took him at his word. And there's a big cure of an upgrade I'm doing right now that I'm using the one, uh, the 2000 series on. Even though the 3000 is the the flagship, I guess, it, it seems like they're, they're focusing more of their development towards the 2000. Um, but anyway, I digress again. Like I said, like, comment, subscribe. Um, there'll be more coming up before too long, and I'm glad you all stopped by. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of your week. Peace out.